Uh, thanks for the intro, Danielle. Yeah, that was that was a throwback. Uh, that was like 15 years ago. So that's the reason I was surprised was just realizing how old I was. Um, happy Thursday. Um, I'm not actually going to talk that much about tech today. I'm going to talk about like a social problem that we have uh, in crypto. So this talk is titled Social Consensus and Self-Policing. And I just wanted to ask folks, um, is anyone aware of like the lemon problem? Like, does that ring a bell? Okay, not, not really, not really. Okay, so in American slang, a lemon is uh, an unreliable car, right? And it's a car that you didn't know was going to be unreliable. I'm not really sure what the origin of it is, but that's what a lemon is. Um, good cars, reliable cars, are called peaches. I did not know that either. I had to look that up. Uh, pretty cute. So the lemon problem is basically the problem of used car dealers, right? You go to a used car dealership, it looks something like this. It feels kind of scammy because... You don't know whether the car you're going to buy is going to be a peach or a lemon. And that's one of the big problems in crypto today, is everything looks like it could be a peach, but some, in fact, a lot of the protocols are lemons. OK, so there's some probability when you, when you buy a car or you use a protocol that it's going to be a peach, and there's some other probability that it's going to be a lemon. So what is the price you're willing to pay? Like, what's the expected value, weighted average price you're willing to pay for something that could turn out to be either, right? So what are you willing to pay for that? And it's like some weighted average thing that you know we could all internalize. Like there's some probability of of lemonness multiplied by the value of the lemonness, plus the probability of peachness multiplied by the value of peachness, right? And and you might be able to intuit that like the value that you're willing to pay is somewhere in between the value you would pay if you knew it was going to peach, it knew it was going to be a peach, and the value that you would pay if you knew it was going to be a lemon. OK, so why is this like a weird dynamic, and why are we talking about fruits? Well, what does this incentivize as like a used car dealer, right? If you know everyone's going to pay the between the peach and lemon price, what's your incentive? Your incentive should just be to sell them lemons, right? Like there's no reason to sell someone a peach. If they're willing to pay more than the price of a lemon, you can just dump lemons on them. So uh, commonly, this is called a scam. Um, and I would just posit this is one of the big problems that crypto has today, is the lemon problem. Um, and, and what happens, the dynamic that happens in crypto today is, well, because we have this lemon problem, the probability of peaches actually goes down. Fewer people are willing to grow peaches because peaches are expensive. And lemon dealers flock to the market because they're like, wow, I can just dump lemons on people who are willing to pay more for my product uh, than it's worth because they're, they're tricked into thinking that it's peaches. And in general, the overall willingness to participate in the ecosystem as a user goes down. Kind of just makes sense. Now I can hear some of you in your head or you know, a fake uh, interlocutor being like, well, that's just the cost of permissionlessness, right? Like, we have to take the good with the bad. Like, it's just a 30% discount on crypto. And you know, that, that's just the way it is. But it's not a one-time cost, right? The lemon problem is not a one-time cost. It's actually a death spiral. Because when we have lower trust, it's harder for the peaches to outcompete the lemons, and the peaches exit, and we get stuck with the lemons. Not a great place to be. So we need to somehow help consumers identify lemons. And I would say, if we don't do it, Gary will. And in fact, he's, really, he's trying really hard already. And so this is why I'm pushing for, if we want to keep the ethos that we've developed within crypto and solve the lemon problem, we need some form of self-policing. So let's just compare this to somebody who's done this well. And this is, this is going to be controversial. Las Vegas, casinos. OK, so what am I saying? John, are you just saying crypto is just a casino? No, I'm saying crypto is not even a casino. We need to do at least as well as casinos. If crypto is to work, we need to do what casinos do well. And I, don't, I think it's worth a look. And, and this, is the, this is what I'll get to next. Casinos famously are focused on fairness and security, famously. And they market that. Why? Why do they do that? They go to great lengths to prove that the casino isn't rigged, other than, of course, like the obvious way in which it's rigged. And, and why is that? And let me give you some examples, right? This is an automatic card counting machine. Um, why do they do that? Why did they move to that instead of just dealers shuffling? They want to prove to you you're not getting rugged, other than, of course, the, the way in which you're structurally getting rugged. But they want to prove to you that it's verifiably random, right? They ban cheaters. They share cheater information with other casinos. Why are they willing to collude against cheaters? 
if I'm, you know, the flamingo, or is that even a casino? Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, I, I find a cheater. Why am I sharing that information with the win, right? They have these, like, die calipers to make sure the die are fairly weighted. All to convince the consumer, you, that you're not getting cheated by them. That you are playing fairly. Even though the, the odds are stacked against you, you're not going to get cheated or scammed. And governments and casinos are actually mutually invested in making casinos safe. Something that like, we forget about casinos is that they're like, really legal and like, really growing. You know, like, Ethereum is on pace to do $2 billion of fees this year. The global casino industry is going to do $300 billion of revenue. Marketing safety has been one of the huge ways that casinos have worked really well with governments to convince them that like this, making this thing safe is good for everyone. Okay, and, and how does this work? This is like the virtuous cycle, right? Like higher trust equals more users equals investments in fairness and safety. And so we need to kind of like do this in a decentralized way. Like we know for a fact, right? One thing that one, three letters that haven't come up this week for me in any conversation, FTX. Nobody's talked about it. We like to pretend like it was just a fever dream, you know? Like bad actors really erode trust in the entire ecosystem. Not just who they're targeting, but in everyone. But like we have the technology to prove safety and legitimacy. We just need to adopt it on the social layer. And so like necessary hand wave for this week. Zero knowledge, right? Like that's that's a word we all know. Like we have the ability to prove integrity, right? The ability to prove integrity of identity, of reputation, of computation. The problem is not the tech, right? Like we keep coming to these conferences and we keep talking about tech. Part of the problem is actually just the social consensus and the ideology. We know we're, we're, we have the ability to create new forms of social consensus around securing applications and users. We need to just accept that that's something that we have to do, that we have to self-police before we get other policed. So I think we're very ideological about it's either fully permissionless or it's fully permissioned. Like it's black or white. It's one or the other. But in reality, there's this like really broad spectrum of social consensus in between. And let me just give you an example of like what ZKs and what Aztec is eventually gonna be working on can unlock. For, and, and this is like anathema to ideology, right? You know, only third-party identified token holders who can prove the legitimacy of funds can enter a pool. This can be both permissionless and permission. I can stand up a pool with these rules, and you can choose whether to enter or not, right? So we have this, like, notion of libertarian paternalism. Like, some, someone somewhere, like the social consensus in this room, is going to decide this is the safe way that we're going to operate. And then the users get to de determine what they want to do. Instead of us being like, it's totally black and white, if there's any permissioning at all, even it's, if it's social, even if it's democratic, like we can't allow it. Another example that Vitalik has been working on with uh, our co-founder, Zach Williamson, is this notion of like cl uh, decentralized cleanness providers. And so like a social graph of individuals who attest to your legitimacy of funds and transactions, who kind of like observe behaviors and go, ah, that's not like something we wanna be associated with, right? And this is very different from centralization. This is very different from censorship. Right? This is a democratic form of social consensus. It's us all saying we're not going to stand for certain behaviors within our ecosystem. And the goal here is to like, still allow users to express their preferences across a wide variety of protocol designs. Right? It's not meant to constrain freedom. It's to give users more choice than I would say they have now. And so ZK kind of this enables this permissionlessness at the base layer uh, while offering, you know, permission social consensus at the application layer. And these are more examples, you know, there are proof of reserves that has been talked about a lot. Um, phishing resistance, opt-in compliant pools, proof of legitimate funds. But all this is to say we just need to turn Zach XBT into ZK, right? We need to use math and social consensus rather than trust or centralized compliance. So just to summarize, we need ZK to unlock kind of like three major improvements. The first is we need to preserve user choice while allowing for self-policing and compliance. Like, we haven't really, as a community and ecosystem, talked about self-policing. We're just hoping and praying that someone else doesn't notice, right? We're not going to get there. We're not Web3 is not going to make it if we allow that to happen. We need to prove to somebody 
that we're looking out for each other and for our users. So we need to prove to users that we as a community have their backs. Let's not try to jam ideology down users' throats, right? Let's give them the choice of where they want to go. Like, that's ultimately what this space is about. It's about freedom, right? It's about autonomy. And finally, we need to improve security. We need to make it reliable. We need to make crypto essential rather than optional. Like, we forget that government is, at least purportedly, comprised of constituents. Like, why, was, why were Uber and Airbnb at one point illegal, and now they're illegal? Because somebody went to the steps of Congress and were like, over my dead body are you taking away my Uber XL? Somebody did that, right? Individuals did that. I don't know if you guys remember that happening, right? And one of the ways that we make crypto essential and baked into the fabric of our economic lives is making sure that it's reliable and it's secure and that we're standing up for our users. And that's how we're going to turn lemons into peaches. Um, OK, and of course I have to do the shill. Um, everyone should go check out Noir. It's our ZK circuit writing language. It is a primitive predecessor to the ultimate fle ultimately flexible ZK system that we're going to build in the future that will allow for this type of programmable uh, social consensus. And you can find out more at docs.aztec.network. Okay, that's it.